Well, hello again and uh, happy Wednesday evening. Uh, we're going to talk today about the story of Joseph. Uh, and this is uh, take two. Uh, I just did the lesson. I uh, got 15 minutes into it and the uh, storage was full on the iPad. So I'm having to do it a second time. Uh, but that's fine. Fortunately, you only have to hear it once. So, uh, but I do appreciate, as always, your, your kind attention. Um, and uh, as we read through, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37, Genesis chapter 37. And when we, I, I love talking about the glories of Christ. Um, and uh, Joseph is a type of Christ. He's considered to be from the Old Testament. And as we see his life, we can see some of those similarities. But also, um, I believe as Christians, when, uh, and there are a lot of evils of the heart that are revealed in, in the uh, Old Testament history. And this is some of them here. And I think if we can recognize uh, some of the things that are out there, some of the hindrances, some of the wickedness that's in our heart and in the heart of our fellow mankind, whether it was thousands of years ago or today, uh, we're more apt to be able to notice and recognize, recognize these things, maybe less apt to make excuses for ourselves. Um, but let's go ahead and, and, and read on here. We're going to start in Genesis 37, and I'm going to start here in verse number 2. Uh, Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flocks with his brothers, while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Billa and the sons of Zilpah. So these were uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob's other wives, uh, besides Rachel and Leah. And of course, their children, all the children together, make up the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Jacob. Okay. Um, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Uh, now, this is probably a true report, I would imagine. Uh, Joseph seems to be a man of integrity, as we see him in his adult life. Of course, he's considered a youth here, but 17 is pretty responsible. Probably they were into something they weren't supposed to be, and he went and told on them and got them, got them in trouble. I remember I was probably about um, maybe 9 or 10, and my uncle took me, uh, his wife, and he had three boys who were about five or six, old, five or six years older than me. And we went to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and uh, we were out swimming and things like that. We were hanging out down by the lake, and we're out there fairly late. It was after 10, 11 o'clock at night because my cousins were talking to a couple of girls. Well, obviously, they want to hang around, and they stayed as long as they could. I got tired of waiting around. I walked back from the lake to the campground by myself. Well, my uh, aunt and uncle were very angry <laughs> at my cousins. I told them, I said, well, they're down there talking to girls. And they're like, they left you walk home alone? So I could hear as I'm in the tent, them, them getting reamed out by my uncle and aunt for having left me. Um, now, they didn't plot to kill me, so that was a good thing, but just that, that anger being told on uh, can really leave you pretty sour. And that's how the brothers fell here. Okay, now, uh, verse number three. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic, uh, or this multicolored coat uh, that, that, he, that he made. Um, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, so they hated him and could not, to speak, could not speak to him on friendly terms, or could not speak even peaceably to him. So here we have the situation where Jacob is in his older years, and he has a son as an older man. And I know we've mentioned before, it's not good to favor one kid over the other. But there are going to be times in the lives of our children, some of them need more attention, some of them may need more money, some of them may need a special coat. Uh, you do not treat every kid uniformly the same. It just doesn't work that way. They're different people. God's made it that way. And they have different needs and different times where they may need more attention over another. Also, Jacob, um, as he's older and has a younger son, uh, the, the men, uh, the grandpas, you guys may notice or recognize it. Perhaps you've mellowed over the years. Um, I was different when we had our first son. I'm worried about uh, earning money, having a career, getting a house, paying a mortgage. There are a lot of exterior pressures on me that make rearing a child a bit more difficult. And I'm more concerned about 
performing the role of father more at that time. But as the second son, the third son comes, you get a little bit older, things are a bit more settled, you have your home, your career settled, you kind of ease up a bit. I think that's why grandparents are so wonderful because they, a lot of those pressures are behind them. And they have time just to come over and love on the kids and be fun and then give them back. Uh, so, so Jacob perhaps was somewhere in there, and not that he's a bad guy because he loved one more than the other, but these are some of the circumstances that are going on. But nonetheless, his brothers, hated Joseph for this. They hated him. Can't even talk peaceably. And and boy, you, you could see um, the, these kind of things go on in our families today. They go on in our churches and our workplaces. And we've got to be careful to make sure that we take these things to the Lord when that bitterness or envy is rising up. Because uh, folks, the world around us is getting more and more crazy. We need to have a peace and a unity in our homes and in our churches and if we can in our workplaces these groups of people that the Lord's given us we've got to be tight because there's so much coming against us nowadays that we need that unity and this envy and bitterness will cause a hatred and ultimately in this case leads to even attempted murder wow the, the, the wickedness of the heart, folks, it, it's, it's a tough thing. It really is. Okay. Now, verse number five. Well, actually, I'm not going to read. We know uh, Joseph has a dream, two dreams, uh, whether it's the sheaves or the constellations. The idea is that uh, prophetically he's seeing in his dreams that his family, his brothers, even his parents are going to bow down to him. So this infuriates the family even more, the brothers particularly. Then it says in verse 12 down to 18, it talks about that the brothers are out with, are supposed to be with the, the sheep in Sechem. Uh, Jacob sends Joseph down to them, uh, which kind of in its, in its sense is a bit odd. Here you have the youngest brother who's gonna go and report back, almost in a supervisory kind of capacity to let the father know what's going on. Again, probably stirred the brothers up even more. Um, but quite honestly, the brothers probably didn't even want him there. Maybe that's why he was back with, with his father in the first place. But in any case, he sends him down. He says, find out what's going on and report back to me. So here we pick that up in verse number 18. It says, when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. Wow. Wow. So again, just like you saw in the heart of Cain towards Abel, out of envy and jealousy, because God honored his sacrifice more than his, uh, or rejected his, but honored Abel's, out of that arises even a spirit of murder, wanting to kill. Uh, and boy, it's, it's just a dangerous thing, and we see that same kind of thing here, uh, and it goes on in the world today, uh, bitterness and envy. Uh, to the point where, where you want to take someone's life. Okay. They said one to another, here comes the dreamer. Oh, here comes the dreamer. Here's the big she. Here's the big moon. Let's all bow down, probably mockingly, but here he comes. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits, and we will say that a wild beast has devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. <laughs> Let's kill him and then see what happens. But Reuben, the oldest, heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit and into the, uh, in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So Reuben, the oldest one, uh, he's, he's, he's pretty stellar role here. He stands up, he says, oh, No, 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 don't, don't kill him. Just throw him on these pits and leave him there. He's, he's going to die anyway. But he's planning to go back later and rescue him out of the pit once the brothers have gone. Uh, verse 23. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the multi-very colored tunic, uh, I'm sorry, the very colored tunic that was on him. They took him and threw him in the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. So as far as they know, their intention that they carried out was murder. You threw him in the pit, there's nothing there, you know he's going to die. Uh, verse 25, 
Then they sat down to eat a meal. Uh, interesting. So here they go. They pretty much murder their brother, even though he's not dead yet, and they have a sandwich. Wow. There's something, when you could sit down and eat a meal after you've killed someone or attempted to kill someone, it really speaks to the coldness of the heart. I remember earlier in the scriptures, or actually it's later in the scriptures, forgive me, um, General Joab, uh, he goes and he gets, he's, he's there to pronounce judgment on Ahab and Jezebel. And Jezebel is up in, the, up in the tower and he has his men pick her up and throw her right out of the tower. And she comes spiraling down and dies on the ground. And of course, just as the prophecy said, the dogs come around and lick up her blood. Joab goes and has lunch. It says it in the scripture. He sits down and has something to eat. It just speaks of the, there's a coldness there. Even in the mafia movies that we see, you see that same kind of thing. You got these gangsters that come out. They shoot somebody out. And they sit down and have some pasta, some bread. Hey, pass the wine. Hey, it's really interesting. And again, it just it just speaks of they're not even shaken by what's going on. Neither were these, neither were these brothers. Sat down and had something to eat. It said they, uh, they raised their eyes and looked, and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites were coming down, and they're bearing some different fragrances. And Judas speaks up, like we talked last time. He says, hey, let, you know, what, instead of letting them there to die, let's make a little money on this deal. We'll sell them to these Ishmaelites. We'll make some money. And, of course, we know that they sell them for 20 pieces of silver. Christ was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by Judas. But you can see that and some other similarities with Christ and with Joseph. Both of them were favored by the Father. Um, Jesus, in a sense, had a, had a covering of a purity and a righteousness um, where Joseph had a physical coat. Um, the sons of Jacob hated Joseph because he was preferred by God. The sons of Jacob centuries later hate Christ because he is the chosen one. Joseph comes and he, he, he tells prophetically of, of who he is and how he's going to stand and they're going to bow to him. Christ eventually opens up that he is the son of God and, that, and he speaks harshly to the Pharisees and the scribes and says, you don't recognize me because you're your father, the devil. So in proclaiming a truth of who he is, those same descendants hate Jesus uh, for, for, for being pure and for being chosen of God and even the Son of God. Very interesting, I think. Okay, so they go and they sell him uh, to the, the Ishmaelites. Uh, the traders come by, they sell him there. And says they, they, they thus brought uh, Joseph into Egypt. So down to 29. Uh, now Reuben returns to the, the pit. Behold, Joseph was not there. So he tore his garment. So he's, he's lamenting over the fact that he's not there anymore. He returns to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said we found this here we, we, we found this tunic can you verify who this belongs to and of course Jacob recognizes it I'm sure it was a rare tunic and he begins to grieve and they, they covered up with a lie they say they're, they're suggesting here and Jacob comes to the realization that perhaps a wild beast has devoured him uh, and Joseph has been torn to pieces so Jacob tore his clothes and put sack sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many, day, many days. Um, the sons tried to comfort him, but he says, I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him to in Egypt to Potiphar, uh, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So here, you know, we, we know what happens. They, they, they basically, they sell him off. They come up with the story. Um, again, very hard, very harsh. Um, you know, okay, so you, you spared his life in a sense. You made some money for yourselves. You sent Joseph off into slavery, into captivity. And generally speaking, that's not good. Joseph's events turn out very good for him. But they don't, they don't assume that at the time. 
Then they go, they lie to their father <clears throat> and leave him under the assumption that he's dead. This is just a vile thing that this family has done. Uh, and again, these are the pillars in, in, in the Jewish uh, community. They, these, are, these are the tribes uh, that, that represent God coming uh, to his people and calling Israel out. Um, but again, the, the depravity of mankind, and I know you may say, well, I would never do that. Um, but let's watch. Let's realize, because that potential is in us. It is there. That is our heart. That is why we are always needing to come before the Lord and ask for grace, ask that he would change and mold and shape us from that into an image more like Joseph, more like Jesus. That is our destiny and is what the Lord desires of us, a pureness before him. That way, when things come against us, when people come against us, instead of acting in vengeance or in hate, there could still be love there still standing up for the truth, still sharing the truth, still being a light, still disclosing things that we may see going on around us that other people may not notice. That's important. It's important for the sake of people's families, their lives, for our church, for our country. But there's a love that undergirds that. So thank you for your time. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.